Hello, this is Ian Parbury. I am going to talk to you today about geometric primitives. This uh, video is intended for my game math and physics class in uh, fall of 2011 because I'm going to be out of town at a conference next week. Alright, so let's start with some things that you should maybe have seen in high school but have probably forgotten by now. Some representation techniques. First of all, I use the term geometric primitive in the title. So what's that? A geometric primitive is uh, a simple geometric object that we can build more complicated objects from if we want, but things that we commonly use in computer games like rays, lines, planes, spheres, and polygons. Now there are three basic ways to represent a geometric primitive and uh, they all have their uses. There's implicit form, there's parametric form, and then there's straightforward form. Well, uh, we couldn't find a better name for straightforward. It's uh, what people use, but more about these in a moment. Okay, we'll start off, look start off looking at implicit form. Implicit form we supply a boolean function f. Now we're mostly in three dimensions here, so this, this will be f of x, y, z. That is true for all points of the primitive and false for all of the other points. So if I have a point x, y, z, I want to know is it uh, on, the, on or in the primitive, then I call f of x, y, z, and it returns true if it is. So for example, the equation for the surface of a unit sphere centered at the origin, the equation um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1 is true for all points on the surface of a unit sphere. Okay. Um, implicit form is useful for things like point inclusion tests. Now certain methods for representing fluid and organic shapes work using implicit representation. For example, a density function is defined for a given point in space by considering the proximity of nearby fluid points. Point P, for example, is considered to be inside the fluid if and only if the density at P exceeds some non-zero threshold. Now there's uh, a specialized algorithm called the marching cubes algorithm. It's a classic technique for converting an arbitrary implicit form into a surface description such as a polygon mesh, so if you're interested in following this up, go Google that. Now parametric form, on the other hand, expresses your point coordinates x, y, and z as functions of another parameter, or parameters that vary between certain limits. For example, consider this pair of functions, x of t, so t is our um, new parameter, x of t is the cosine of 2 pi t, y of t is the sine of 2 pi t. Notice we're expressing x and y as functions of our new parameter t. Now t varies from 0 through 1, let's see, let's say. So as t varies from 0 to 1, the point x of t, y of t, describes a unit circle. So for example, when t is 0, we're here. As t goes towards a quarter, we move along this line as t equals a quarter. As t moves to a half, we go to here. t moves to three quarters. Finally, t goes to one, and we end up back at the beginning. So as t varies, we're taken around this unit circle centered at the origin. So that's an example of parametric form. It's called parametric because we don't think of x and y as uh, points, but as functions of a new parameter. Now, it's convenient to use what people often call a normalized parameter in the range 0 through 1, but we could allow t to assume any range of values. Another common choice is between 0 and n, where n is, well, the, let's call it the length of the primitive, some, uh, some measure that in, uh, intuitively captures the idea of, of length. Where now, functions are in terms of one parameter, we say they're univariate. Of course, when it's two parameters, we call it bivariate three, trivariate, etc. So univariate functions trace out a 1D shape, a curve. Now it's common 
to use uh, if we have a bivariate function, two parameters, s and t. They trace out a surface rather than a line in 3D space. A straightforward form is the one we use when communicating with each other. It's non-mathematical. There are no equations. It's easy for humans to understand, and I've been using it already. If I say a unit sphere centered at the origin, you all know what I mean. The concept of degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom is the minimum number of pieces of information. We put that in quotes, so we're being loose here which are required to describe the entity unambiguously, or the geometric primitive unambiguously. Some representation forms use more numbers than others. So, uh, yeah, in our case, pieces of information usually are numbers. Usually due to redundancy, uh, due that uh, could be eliminated by assuming the appropriate constraints, such as a vector having unit length. So when things are overspecified, we can uh, fix that by putting extra constraints on, if we wish. Okay, so beginning with lines and rays. Now the classical definitions, or the, the ones that a mathematician would use, are that a line extends infinitely in two directions. A line segment is a finite portion of a line that has two endpoints, so it's not infinite in either direction, and uh, a ray is in between. It's half of a line that has an origin and extends infinitely in one direction, so if you like, it's a line segment at one end and a line at the other end. Now, the computer graphics folks have uh, conventionally used the term ray uh, slightly differently to denote a directed line segment. So for us, a ray will have an origin and an endpoint. It defines a position, a finite length, and, well, unless it has zero length, which we'll try not to have, a direction. Mm, this is good coffee. I hope you're sitting in front of your computer drinking coffee, listening to this. Now, ray also defines a line and a line segment, the line containing it, the line segment containing it. Rays are important in computational geometry and computer graphics, which is why I'm talking about them. So a line extends infinitely in two directions, down here. Uh, a line segment is a finite portion, so we denote, denote extending infinitely by these two arrowheads. We denote uh, ending here uh, by putting two dots. A ray then for us is a directed line segment. It starts here and it ends there, but it has a direction. Okay. Now we can represent rays in several different ways. One way is the two-point representation. We give the two points that are the array origin, call it uh, p origin, and the ray endpoint, call it p n. So here's p origin, here's p end, and we draw the arrow from the origin to the end. The parameter parametric representation consists of three equations in t. Remember, we're in three dimensions, so we need three equations. First one, x of t is x naught plus t, there's a parameter, times delta x. y of t, similarly, y naught plus t times delta y. z of t, z naught plus t times delta z. And we restrict t in the range 0 through 1 um, inclusive. And so as we vary t, x, the point x, y, z moves from the beginning to the end of the line. Alternatively, we can use vector notation uh, for the same thing. Uh, so make a vector out of x, y, and z, then p of t is p naught. Take the uh, uh, x naught, y naught, z naught, put them into um, a point p naught, or a vector uh, p naught and add in t times d, where d is the delta x, delta y, delta z. Same thing, just different notation. So p of 0 is the origin point, p of 1 is the end point, and d is the ray's length and direction, where p of 1 is p0 plus d. Uh, 
Uh, there's another variant in common use let uh, d be a unit vector, vary t in the range uh, 0 through l, where l is the length of the ring. In this case, p of 0 is p0, the origin point. p of l is p0 plus ld, the endpoint. d is the raised direction. I'm sorry, that l there should be a curly l like this. So please correct your lecture notes. Now, lines in 2D, the implicit representation of a line is, of course, by the equation. Uh, let's go in two dimensions. We've got x and y. Pick th three constants here, a, b, and d. Then the equation ax plus by equals d is the equation of a line. Yeah, you remember that from high school. Some people prefer the longer ax plus by plus d equals 0. That's simply a matter of taking the d over onto the side. Just forgetting the negative sign doesn't matter. Um, the d in here is actually the negative of the d there, so call this d1 and this d2 if you like, and d2 is negative d1. Um, in vector notation, let n be the vector ab, that's using this a and this b, p be uh, a point xy, so we're encapsulating this these two coordinates, and we can use dot product. The same equation can be rewritten as p dot n equals d. Uh, p dot n is ax plus by, yeah, equals d. Hmm, cool. Um, a special case here, if we make n the unit vector, and of course scale d appropriately, then d is the signed distance from the origin to the line measured perpendicular to the line. That is parallel to n. By sign distance, we mean that d is positive the lines on the side of the origin that the normal points towards. And as d increases, the line moves in the direction of n. All right, so here we have um, the uh, line p dot d, p dot n equals d, the normal, and the distance d. Oh, yeah, cool. So we're specifying a line by specifying its normal. That's a cool concept. Another variation, you give a point Q on the line rather than the distance to the origin. Any point will do. And the direction of the line is again described using a normal to the line N. Like this. So this time we specify the normal. We specify Q. The normal here, we specify Q. Uh, no need to specify the distance anymore. This is enough. Now, um, in... I'm sure in school the teacher made you do lots of slope intercepts. If we express y equals mx plus b, express the equation of the line like this, then m is the slope of the line, which is uh, the ratio of rise over run. Remember that? Um, for every rise units that we move up, we move run units to the right, or vice versa. And b is the y-intercept. If we set x equals 0, then we get y equals b. So uh, the line crosses the y-axis at y equals b. Remember this? You probably haven't looked at this for years, right? So here's a, a picture. Here's our line, y equals mx plus b. m is rise divided by run. So this is rise. This is run. Um, so it doesn't really matter how big we draw this. The, the fraction ends up the same. Uh, the y-intercept at at uh, y equals b is here. So I should have put a label here, b. Caveats, the slope of a horizontal line is always zero. A vertical line has infinite slope and cannot be represented in slope-intercept form because the Im implicit form of a vertical line is x equals k, where k is the... Um, x equals k is a vertical line, so that's where it hits the x-axis. Yet another form, another way to specify a normal vector n. So here's our line here. We specify a normal vector n and the perpendicular distance d from the line to the origin. The normal is the direction. The uh, distance is its uh, and we can express it also as the perpendicular bisector of two points R and Q. So if I give you R and Q and tell you it's the perpendicular bisector, so that specifies uniquely it's a line halfway in between 
that is perpendicular to this. In fact, this is historically one of the earliest definitions of a line, the set of all points equidistant from two given points, Q and R. So we'll start out with some line conversions. To convert a ray defined using two points into parametric form, then in our parametric form P0 is P origin, so uh, yeah, so given P origin and P end, we want to find P0 and D. Uh, D is the distance between these two, um, it's uh, Pn minus P origin. The opposite conversion, remember D is a vector. Um, so the opposite conversion from parametric form to two points form is pretty easy, so this is the opposite of that. That is, well, uh, we t add P org to both sides and P org equals P naught, so P end equals P naught plus D, that's how we take um, parametric form and convert it to two points form. Very easy so far. Given a parametric ray, we can compute the implicit line that contains the ray. Um, okay, so given a parametric ray, we're given the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the origin and uh, the endpoint. Um, and we want to find uh, the constants A, B, and D. So A is uh, the y coordinate of, of the uh, d vector, B is negative the x coordinate, and uh, D is P origin's x coordinate times dy minus P origin's y coordinate times dx. Now, to convert a line expressed implicitly, so an implicit line, to slope-intercept form, now note that we've got a little notational uh, um, confusion here. B is the traditional variable to use in both slope-intercept and implicit form. So let's add some color to the distinguish between the two Bs. So a red B means implicit form B, and the black B is in slope-intercept form B. So uh, this is the slope intercept B is uh, D divided by the implicit form B. The uh, gradient is in the um, slope intercept. The slope is minus A divided by the B in the uh, implicit form. Converting a line expressed implicitly, an implicit line to normal and distance form, the um, normal is, uh, take the vector a, b from the implicit formula, divided by the distance, uh, divided by the uh, length of that, so that makes sure n is normalized. The distance is d divided by this normalization factor. Converting a normal and a point on the line to normal and distance form, assuming n is normal, well, we just use the same old n, the distance is uh, the dot product of n and q. Perpendicular bisector to implicit form gets a little complicated. So we want to get the constants a, b, and d from the implicit form where we are given q and r. All right. We take the two vectors q and r, we um, average them, and we take the dot product of that result with a, b, where we found a and b above. A is the dis difference between the y coordinates be the uh, difference between the x coordinates. Um, all right, double of that, and it ends up being rx qy minus qx r. Oh, well, we've got this nice crossover thing going on here. All right, that's enough for lines. Let's look at spheres and circles. Okay, so a um, sphere is a set of all points equidistant from a given point. Yeah, so here we've got the center point C. The, the distance from the center of the sphere to a point on the sphere, sorry, I forgot to say that, is known as the radius. Well, obviously. The straightforward representation of a sphere then is uh, the center C and the radius R. 
Now a circle is of course a 2D sphere, or a sphere is a 3D circle, depending on your perspective. It's all about perspective. So here we go. That's our center point. That's a uh, XYZ set of uh, coordinates and the radius is a constant out to the edge of the sphere. Now spheres in games are often used uh, in collision detection. They're a very simple uh, kind of collision detection. In simple games, the kind you'll make in college, it's often enough. Often, sorry, good enough. Now, that said, it's not, not a waste of time learning about it because it's used in the industry for fast rejection because uh, um, collision with a uh, intersection with a sphere is a very simple thing to compute and most um, most collision detection tests fail like, right? most things don't collide so it's a good way of getting rid of the things that definitely don't collide uh, the ones that are left over you do some more complicated uh, collision detection so it's uh, for fast rejection now Rotating a sphere, of course, doesn't change its shape, so a bounding sphere can be used for an object regardless of its orientation. That's one thing that makes it very fast. The implicit form of a sphere with center C and radius R is the set of points P such that norm of P minus C is R. Yeah, for collision detection, P is inside the sphere if that... Um, the norm of P minus C is less than or equal to R, or expanding this if P is a point X, Y, Z, and of course C and P you can express using C, X, C, Y, C, Z, uh, P, X, P, Y, P, Z. Um, so if, if P is, sorry, X, Y, Z, then uh, X minus C, X squared plus Y minus C, Y squared equals R squared is the expansion of, of this for a circle. For a sphere, x minus cx, y minus cy, z minus cy, all squared, summed together, is r squared. So you can see we've got some uh, some squares, and in here we don't have to do a square root if we just square everything on both sides. Now some measurements for both um, circles and spheres, we compute the diameter d, that is the distance from one point, not to the center, but to a point on the exact opposite side going through the center and the circumference C, the distance all the way around the circle, uh, um, that is going the longest way from the radius R at follows, as follows. So uh, the circumference will be measured, uh, I guess you could take a plane, put it through the center of the, the uh, sphere and the circle that it traces out where the plane intersects the sphere, the uh, distance around that is the circumference. So D equals to R, right, the uh, diameter is twice the radius, the circumference is 2 pi times the radius, which is pi times the diameter. The area of a circle is pi r squared. Extending that from 2D to 3D to a sphere, the surface area S of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. The volume V is uh, 4 pi r squared over 3, so 4 thirds pi r squared. You know, I think that's a bug. How can it be pi r squared? Shouldn't that be pi r cubed? I think I've made a mistake here. All right, so bounding boxes. We've talked about bounding spheres. Um, they can be very inaccurate. If we bound our objects for collision detection by a box, that'll be slightly more accurate. So like spheres, bounding boxes are also used in collision detection in games. Two kinds, the AABB, the Actually Aligned Bounding Box, has its sides aligned with the world axis. So no matter how the object rotates, the AABB stays aligned with the world axis. The uh, OABB is the Object Aligned Bounding Box. That's a bounding box uh, around the object aligned with the object axis. So as the object rotates, the OABB rotates to the AABB does not. Actually, actually aligned bounding boxes are much simpler to create and to use. So uh, for one thing, they also are used for fast rejection. Here are three objects, a tall 
skinny one. It's got a tall skinny bounding box. The uh, teapot has a, a, a wide bounding box. The sphere has a cubicle, a cubic, cube bounding box. Um, right now you could think of these as AABBs or OABBs. They're, they're OABBs that happen to be aligned with the world space axes. So the world so AABBs. Now to uh, detect whether a point XYZ is inside an AABB, you simply do a quick bounce check. Our X, Y, and Z in between the X, Y, and Z coordinates, X min to X max, Y min to Y max, Z min to Z max, of the bounding box. There are two special corner points of the bounding box. They're diagonally opposite, P min and P max. P min is X min, Y min, Z min, P max is X max, Y max, Z max. The center of the bounding box is uh, the uh, centroid. It's the average of P min and P max, P min plus P max over two. Notice these are all vectors. The size of an AABB uh, we'll express that size as a vector because uh, it'll have possibly a different size in the x, y, and z coordinates. Size vector is the vector from p min to p, p max, and it contains the width, height, and length of that box. So s equals p max minus p min. And uh, yeah, okay, the x coordinate will be the uh, the x distance from the one corner to another, for instance. The radius vector is the vector from the center to p max. P max minus C, and that's uh, S over 2. It's the uh, half of the size vector. Now, defining an AABB, to unambiguously define an AABB, you need only two of the five vectors that we've described so far P min, P max, C, S, and R. Other than the pair S and R, any pair can be used. Some of these are more useful than others, depending on what situation you're in. It's a good idea in general, though, to represent a bounding box using p min and p max, since in practice these end up being needed far more frequently than, for example, c, s, and r. Of course, computing any of these three from p min, min and p max is very fast, so I guess we're really wasting our time talking about it anyway. So here's a little bit of code to declare an AABB, class AABB3, so 3 because it's three-dimensional, I guess. Will public have two vectors, 3D vectors, min and max, public member variables. So an empty AABB will first reset the min and max values to infinity or something that's effectively bigger than any number we'll encounter in practice. So here we go, void AABB3, make it empty. Const float k big number equals, I guess Fletch has figured out this is a, a really big number that you can store as a float. So we'll set min x, y, and z to be big, and max x, y, and z to be very small. So yeah, max is smaller than min. So yeah, any kind of reasonable code that you write will uh, detect this as being an exceptional case. Now, we can add a single point into the AABB. And so if we do this for every point in a uh, 3D model, we'll end up getting an AABB for the whole thing. Mm. OK, cool. That's where we're going. So adding a single point to the AABB. So let's say we're adding the point P, uh, which has x, y, and z coordinates. So here we go, void add P. Um, if P dot x is less than uh, min x, set min x to, oh yeah, if p dot x is bigger than max, oh, we do this for the x, y, and z. So for each set of coordinates, we adjust our min and max to include this new coordinate. Excellent. So let's say to add a list of points, so here's a list of points of length n, vector 3, list n. First we declare ourselves uh, an AABB. We empty it, and then for each point, for i become 0 to uh, n minus 1, do the following, add, call the add function, of the ith member of the list. So, comparing AABBs to spheres, I said both 
AABBs and bounding spheres can be used as uh, fast rejection and collision detection. Now computing an AABB for a set of points is easy and takes linear time. Time linear in the number of points is blindingly fast, in fact. Um, computing the optimal bounding sphere can be a much more difficult problem. For m but sometimes it's really worth doing. For many objects that arise in practice, ABBs uh, provide a tighter bounding volume and, and better trivial rejection, but often uh, bounding spheres are better. So I tend to choose ABBs in practice. So which is best? The bounding sphere is better for some things. So up here we've got a car. A bounding sphere is really bad. A bounding Sorry, a bounding circle is bad, a bounding box is good. Here we have this uh, jagged star-shaped object, bounding box, bounding uh, square and bounding circle, they're pretty good. We have a gun, bounding circle is really bad, a bounding box is good. When the gun's rotated, um, they're both equally bad in a way. So when a sphere is bad, notice it can be really bad. In the worst case, the ABB volume will be uh, just a little bit less than twice the sphere volume. Now when you transform an object, its ABB changes. So if it's a, a, a long skinny object and it rotates, yeah, the ABB could get bigger or smaller. You can recompute a new AABB from the transformed object if you want. That can be a little slow. It's faster, in fact, to transform the AABB itself. But the transformed AABB may not be an AABB. So what a lot of people do is transform the AABB and then compute a new AABB from the transformed box, which may be a little bit bigger than it has to be. There are some small but significant optimizations that you can use when computing the new AABB. So the downside, as I said, is it gives you an a, a larger AABB than you should have had. So let's take an example. Over here is our original object, the star, and it's AABB in gray. Let's suppose we rotate the star. So in gray, we've shown here what would happen if I rotated the AABB. Of course, you don't want to do this. You want a new AABB. Ideally, you'd want this, the AABB of the rotated object. And you could recompute it from these points. Um, but if instead, let's imagine that the star has lots and lots and lots of points instead of one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, a dozen or so points. Um, that would be costly to do. Instead, if we take this rotated bounding box, which has four points, and then compute an AABB from those points, we get this, the AABB of the rotated AABB, which is a little bit bigger. But for fast rejection, maybe it's good enough. <coughs> Excuse me, I need a little bit more coffee here. Now some code. Most graphics APIs, DirectX among them, have a matrix 4x3, a 4x3 transform matrix that can represent any affine transform. So remember, it has uh, it's a, uh, that kind of 4x3 four matrix has um, the rightmost column being 0001 transpose. So it's really the uh, leftmost 4x3 that we're interested in. Okay, so here's some code for an AABB function set to transformed box. Given this box transformed by this matrix. Okay, so we start with the last row of the matrix, which is the translation portion. So we'll set min equals max equals get translation M. Then we examine each of the nine matrix elements and compute the new AABB. So we look at M11, M1, yeah, okay. Um, if M11 is bigger than zero, you, okay, we start with zero. Okay, compute a new AABB. The rest of the code we do the same for M12 through M33 by essentially just changing this piece, the, the one one. Alright, 
So for example here, m11 is replaced by m12. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of the code, but it's easy to make those changes. And we're done. Okay. So planes, yeah, a plane in 2D is a, a line. Planes in 3D, plane in 3D is the set of points equidistant from two points. Remember how we defined, oh, we found we could define a, a line as the set of points in 2D equidistant from, from uh, two points. Uh, a plane is the same thing in 3D. A plane then is perfectly flat, has no thickness, and extends infinitely in all directions. They're very often used during video games. The implicit form of a plane is given by all of the points P with x, y, z coordinates that satisfy the plane equation ax plus by plus cz equals d. So this looks like the um, uh, line implicit form, but we've added the third dimension. We can also, like we did with lines, express them using dot product p dot n equals d, where n is uh, n consists of the constants a, b, c. Now, unlike mathematicians, we will find a need to distinguish between the front and the back of a plane. Um, we'll define the front of the plane to be the side that the normal vector n points away from. And we're going to use this to uh, call out back-facing triangles, triangles that face away from the camera. More later, when we get to graphics. Another common way to define a plane is to give three non-collinear points, so three arbitrary points, not in a straight line, that are in a plane. And we do this because, of course, collinear points uh, won't do because there would be an infinite number of planes containing that line. You could rotate around that line. There's no way of telling which one we mean. But every set of three non-collinear points defines a unique plane passing through them. Remember that I said this is uh, one reason to use triangles not polygons when uh, rendering an object because um, the points in a triangle are, are always co coplanar um, regardless of any round off error that you might have accumulated during your uh, set of transformations on on the points you know float, floating point values tend to creep So let's compute n and d, the normal vector n and the, the uh, constant d, for a plane that passes through three non-collinear points, p1, p2, and p3. Now which way will n, the normal vector point? Um, we could have a point either way. Uh, the standard way is to do it in a left-handed coordinate system. Well, okay, okay. the standard, point, standard way of doing it when you're in a left-handed coordinate system is to insist that p1, p2, and p3 are listed in clockwise order. We do this in computer graphics a lot, so we can do fast uh, backface culling. And re remember, I've talked to you about this before. Uh, they'll sit in clockwise order when viewed from the front of the plane. In a right-handed coordinate system, we'd assume the points are listed in counterclockwise order, so that the equations are the same. So here we are with a plane, the front side. Um, we've got three non-collinear points, p1, p2, and p3. We've got the normal vector. Okay, so we can construct two vectors, e1 and e3. And what happened to e2? Gee, we're using e1 and e3 more later, I suppose. The cross product of these two vectors will yield the perpendicular vector. So we'll let a3 be the vector from p1 to p2, and e1 be the vector from p2 p3, the cross product then, remembering the left hand rule, if you make your fingers curl over here, your thumb points in the direction of the normal, the normal will point uh, in this direction, not downwards. Um, so we use E for E1 and E3, standing for edge vector. Uh, these equations commonly arise in computer graphics when computing the plane equation for a triangle. So E3 is P2 minus P1, E1 is P3 minus P2, and N is then E3 cross E1 using the cross product. This should become clear uh, as we figure out the equations, or at least as uh, Slati Bartfast said to Arthur Dent in Hitchhiker's Guide, 
things may not become perfectly clear, but they may become clearer than they are now. Now, occasionally, we may wish to compute the plane equation for a set of more than three points. Find the best fit plane for a bunch of points. The most common example of such a set of points is the vertices of a polygon. In this case, the vertices are assumed to be numbered in clockwise fashion. So one naive solution would be, um, okay, naive, because it's simple, just pick three points and uh, compute three consecutive points in that list and compute the plane equation from those three points. But the three points we choose may be bad because they may be collinear or even worse, nearly collinear because it'll be numerically inaccurate then. Or perhaps the polygon's concave and the three points we've chosen are a point of concavity and therefore form a counterclockwise turn or the vertices of the polygon may not be coplanar, which can happen due to round-off error, as I've said. What we want is a way to compute the best fit plane for a bunch of points in 3D. Alright, so we start by computing the best fit plane normal. Given n points, p1 to pn, where each point, pi, is xi, yi, zi, each of these are floating point values, the best fit perpendicular vector is given by n, nx, ny, and z, where um, let's close your second and let pn plus 1 be the same as p1. nx is the sum, i equals 1 to n, of zi plus zi plus 1 times yi minus yi plus 1. Yeah, of course, when i gets to be n, we're talking z n plus 1. We'll take that to be uh, z1 here. So here's a piece of code uh, to compute the best fit normal and it's uh, pretty obvious here given a vector and uh, a number a result which uh, eventually down here will return we start out with it being the zero vector we do stuff with it we normalize it and we return it okay so the do stuff with it um, let p be the previous vertex for i gets 0 to n minus 1. Um, so let c be a pointer to the ith vertex just to be cheap here. We use it here. So this really is um, uh, vizz. So yeah, multiply them together piece by piece like this. Get the next vertex, go around the loop. Okay, so this essentially just implements what we saw on the previous slide. Now, the best fit plane distance, then, the uh, best fit d value is the average of the d values for each point. So add up pi dot n for the ith point, add them all up, average them, and you get this. Right? Remembering that, um, uh, that plus and dot product are um, distributive, <laughs> um, we can express it like this. Add up all the points end up with a, a vector here, a dot product with n, and then divide by the number of points. Okay, so that's the best fit plane. Now on to another problem. Let's suppose we want to compute the distance from a point to a plane. Now, this could be interesting, this could be useful in, if we're doing really accurate collision detection, once we've used bounding boxes or bounding spheres to reject um, the um, obvious misses once we... Okay, we could then next do uh, OBBs, oriented bounding boxes, around the parts of the object. If it was a character, parts around its arms, legs, etc. Um, to reject more. And then within each of those, we could then do uh, triangle by triangle collision detection. That is, for each point, detect how far it is from the plane of the triangle. Um, so imagine a plane that we've generated, say, from a triangle here, and a point Q which we assume to be not in the plane, not exactly in the plane. There is point P, then, that lies in the plane and is the closest point to Q. So uh, we could draw this uh, right angle vector here from P to Q. P is the point where it hits. It's, per it's parallel to the normal. Um, so the line from P to Q is perpendicular to the plane 
and thus is of the form a times the normal, remembering vectors want to be three, free, even though I've drawn the normal here and this vector over here, they're not, not actually anchored at any point. This vector is a constant a times this vector for some scalar a. Now, if we assume that the, pl the normal n is a unit vector, then the distance from p to q, and thus the distance from q to the plane, is simply a. This distance will be negative when q is on the back side of the plane, so compute a as follows. a is q dot n minus d. How do we know that? Well, p plus a n equals q, so p plus a n dot n, sorry, this should be bold, that should be bold too. Um, no, hang on, is that n or is that... Yes, it is, because that's the dot product. So we can take the dot product with n on both sides. So that dot n equals that dot n. So uh, dot product um, distributes over addition of vectors. So um, n dot p is here. A n dot n is there. Any vector dotted with itself is its length, which is 1. So that's just a. Um, p dot n is uh, p dot n is d plus a equals q dot n, which means a is q dot n minus d, and we're done.